Take your hymnals and turn to number 676, O Jesus, I Have Promised, number 676. This morning is the portion of text that we'll be looking at as we continue on in the study of the book of Exodus. You recall that last week, Reverend Ken Olson spoke on There's a War On. The previous week was Reformation Sunday. The week before that, we finished part 14 of the spiritual gifts. And so we are starting some brand new material today as we look at Exodus chapter 3 and verses 13 through 15. And you probably noticed as you went through that text, or as we read it together, that God names himself. It's not a name that people have given to God. It's not a name that someone has come up with uh, on their own. It's the name that God chose for himself. In fact, as we look at this text here, we discover that there are eight names of God listed in these three verses. Eight names of God in just three verses as he speaks to Moses out of the burning bush and describes to Moses who he is. We should pay close attention when God tells us his name because name speaks of character 
And when God tells us who he is, as he calls his people out of bondage into service. We saw that as God had issued the call to Moses and is now sending Moses to the children of Israel, the thing that God wants the children of Israel to know is his name. There are many things that he has done, but what is important to God as he calls his people to come forth is not merely what he has done, but who he is. And that is given to us in the eight names of God that are listed in these three verses. The first name that is given is, I am that I am. A very incredible and unique name, a very powerful name, as we'll see in a moment. The second is the abbreviated form of that, I am. A very interesting name that occurs in the Gospels, in the New Testament. You may not have known that, but it's there. The third name that is given is Lord, with all capital letters. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. The next name is God, capital G with a small O-D. And then we find it in the phrase altogether, the Lord God of your fathers. It's a very specific Lord God. But it's not merely the Lord God of your fathers, for there were many of their fathers that had gone before them that did not believe. There were many who had been rebellious. There were many who had not walked in fellowship. There were many who had committed grievous sins, as you think back to the founders of the twelve tribes. And so God delineates it even more closely. The God of Abraham. But someone might argue and say the God of Abraham, well, Abraham had not only a son by the name of Isaac, but he also had a son by the name of Ishmael, and he also had other sons by Keturah and the concubines. And so God delineates himself more closely. The Lord God, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God tells us who he is. He refines and delineates precisely who this God is that is coming to the children of Israel and who has sent Moses to declare his name to them. Even though they had been in bondage for 400 years, they would remember this name. We'll see where they got that name from in the first place, because God is making reference as he speaks to Moses back to a very important time at the cutting of a covenant with Abraham. Now, notice something else as we look at the text here. In spite of the fact that eight different names designate God in this passage, God refers to his name in the singular. He says, does not say, these are my names forever. He says, this is my name forever. Notice also at the end of verse 15, it says, his name is a memorial unto all generations. It's perpetual. His name is one that has gone on and on and on and on. It is a memorial unto all generations. Today is Veterans Day, formerly called Armistice Day, until Veterans Day was officially declared in 1954. It commemorates our military veterans, not only the veterans of World War I. That was the war to end all wars, and so they named it after the armistice, never expecting there would be another world war and many other wars would follow. Today is also like Memorial Day on May 30th, which is also called in the South Decoration Day, dates back to the time of the war between the states. Fourth of July is a Memorial Day, 
when we remember the Declaration of Independence, the Revolutionary War, and our beginning as a free and independent nation. But we do not know how long that will last. Those are special times to remember our military heroes. But, you know, there are only a few days out of the year. But God did not merely give us a few days out of the year to remember him. Oh yes, there's Reformation Sunday and Thanksgiving and Christmas and Resurrection Sunday. And there are also other special days with special commemorations. And if we were into Catholicism or Anglicanism or Eastern Orthodoxy, there would be many, many more. From the Feast of Stephen to Michaelmas, from the Annunciation to the Assumption of Mary, but God's word says our memorial is his name. That's something that lasts every day, every hour of the day, every minute of every hour of the day, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Tipping our hat to God and showing up for services twice a year on Christmas and Easter utterly misses the point of remembering God for who he is. No, he did not merely give us a few days out of the year to remember him. He gave us his name. This is my name forever and this is my memorial unto all generations. Now it's not it's not wrong to remember special acts of God at special times of the year. Those are memorials of things that God did. And the Feast of Israel were given that way to remind Israel of things that God did, such as the Feast of Passover or the Feast of Tabernacles. These are remembrances of his acts. But what he has given to us, which is perpetual for every day, is his name. That tells us who he is, his character, his promises, his word of instruction, of comfort, of exhortation. His name tells us of his glory. We need to remember him not only for what he has done, but we must remember him for who he is. And that is the reason that he has given us his name as a memorial forever. Now, in our text today, the first name by which God calls himself is I am that I am. That's actually a declaration and an explanation of God's covenant name, which God gave to Abraham when he first called Abraham in Genesis 12.1. In Genesis 12.1, it says, the name where the name of the Lord appears, it tells us that his name is Yahweh, Jehovah. Yahweh is the root name from which that phrase, I am that I am, comes. It is also the covenant name that is used of God each time he reaffirms his covenant with Abraham in Genesis 13, Genesis 15, Genesis 17, Genesis 21, and Genesis 22. God keeps coming back and reaffirming his covenant with Abraham. He calls him in Genesis 12. He tells him to go to what we know today as modern-day Israel. He gives him a promise concerning that land, concerning his descendants as a multitude, and concerning one specific descendant, the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all the nations of the world will be blessed. And God uses the name Yahweh, which is a form of this phrase, I am that I am, has sent thee unto thee. For example, in Genesis 15, 18, In the same day the Lord, that's Yahweh, Jehovah, made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Israel as a nation has never yet experienced those boundaries, all the way from the Euphrates River, which is in Iraq, all the way over to the River of Egypt, which is the Nile River in Egypt. That's a large piece of territory. But someday God will fulfill that 
when our Lord Jesus Christ reigns on earth. And you can read the descriptions of the boundaries of the land and the boundaries of the tribes and the portion given to Messiah the Prince in the last few chapters of the book of Ezekiel. A day is coming when that will be fulfilled. And God made that covenant promise to Abraham. So let me summarize. In other words, the name Jehovah, Yahweh, is a different form of that same word, translated I am, ehie, the Hebrew word, which is used in that phrase and occurs 211 times in 185 verses in Genesis alone. I didn't have time to count all the rest of them, all the rest of the way through the Bible, but it occurs 185, 211 times in 185 verses in the book of Genesis in 50 chapters. God wants us to know his name. Because he is a God who is a covenant-keeping God. He is a God who keeps his promises. He is a God who never denies his word. He is a God who never reneges on what he has told us that he is going to do. Therefore, we find the phrase, I am that I am, as an explanation that God is giving to Moses of his own covenant name. In Hebrew, the words are what we would roughly call in English. Now, English and Hebrew don't have exact parallels. They have what are called binyanim, which is the, the different houses uh, in which tenses, if you can call it that, of verbs, for example, are categorized. They don't have exact, we don't have exactly in English what they do have in Hebrew, but we can roughly uh, call it a future continuous tense. I am that I am is a, roughly speaking, future continuous tense. Ehye asher ehye. I will be that which I will be. I am self-determinative. The name expresses God's personal designation of himself as self-existent, as self-sustaining, as self-eternal, as self-determining. The name is the name of God who is sovereign with no external needs, with no external obligations. This is the name of God who makes his own choices based on his own character and determination, not upon external pressures, people pushing him to do things. This is the revelation by his name of who God has always been, whom God is now, of who God will always be. I am that I am. This is the full name that he calls himself. When he usually speaks of himself and when others speak of him or when the text refers to him by this name, it usually uses the abbreviated form Yahweh, translated Lord with all capital letters. He is the one who is self-existent in the past, self-existent in the present, self-existent in the future. He has uninterrupted continuance and duration. He has unchanging nature, immutability. He neither expands and grows, nor diminishes and grows weaker. Sometimes the name Jehovah, Yahweh, is abbreviated in the Hebrew text with the name Yah. Not Yahweh, but just Yah. That name Yah occurs 49 times in the Old Testament. Interesting, seven times seven. This abbreviation speaks of a personal God also. When you look at each of those 49 contexts, you discover a personal God who has a special relationship with his people in redemption, in salvation. He is the one who has become our salvation. We see that just a few chapters later in Exodus where it occurs for the first time in Exodus chapter 15, the Lord, and here it is all capitals, L-O-R-D, but in the Hebrew text, it is the abbreviated form of Yahweh. It is, Yah is my strength and song, and he is become my salvation. He is my God, and here a different word is used, a different name, the, the name El. And I will prepare him in habitation, my father's God, and here is the expanded form of El, Elohim, and I will exalt him. The Lord, Yahweh, is a man of war. 
The Lord is his name. Here is the God who becomes our salvation. That's what the text says. He is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. And in the very next word, verse, it tells us the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. It takes us back to the promise at the burning bush to Moses when he is declaring his name. Yahweh is his name. This is the God who is just. This is the God who goes to war for his people. This is the God who will not tolerate sin and will judge the earth. Friends, this is Jesus because that is what we see in Revelation 19. The God who goes to war. And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he is clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth out the winepress of the fierceness of his and wrath of Almighty God. And now verse 16. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Did you notice how many times name was mentioned in this passage? And each time it is mentioned, it gives us another dimension of the character of our Lord Jesus Christ as the one who is righteous, the one who is holy, the one who is pure, the one who will not tolerate sin, the one who will judge sin. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. In the Bible, the word name speaks of nature and character, especially when it is talking about the revealed names of God. It also speaks of authority. We'll talk about this later, but I'll give you an illustration. When you hear the phrase, open in the name of the law, you know that you are dealing with authority. It can be a 98-pound weakling on the other side of the door, but he has the full weight and authority of the law behind him. The mugger inside may be a 300-pound, 7-foot giant with a battle axe, but the authority is behind the 98-pounder who is a policeman standing outside and saying, open in the name of the law. Name speaks of authority. Name also speaks of value. We talk about brand names. What do we mean? Those are the ones that are well established. Those are the ones that have proven themselves over a period of time. Those are the ones that you know are valuable. And as a result, those are normally the ones that are more expensive. Name speaks of value. Proven value. Even so it is with our Lord. It also speaks of status. Here we have his name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Much we say about name, but we'll hold that for now. What we have here is a magnificent insight when we remember what the New Testament says about our Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 1, back a few chapters, beginning in verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you and peace from him. Now listen. Which is and which was and which is to come. Remember, that's what the name I am that I am is talking about. The self-existent one. The one who was from eternity past. The one who is right now. The one who will be in eternity future, unchanging, unchangeable, immutable. The self-existent God, upon whom all else depends, 
for existence. And here is the book of Revelation. It was given to John as an amanuensis, gave it unto him as a servant to show things which was shortly come to pass. But who is it really from? From him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, which we just read about a moment ago in chapter 19, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And now Jesus speaks. I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the ending, saith the Lord. Now listen to this. Which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Magnificent. The one speaking to Moses out of the burning bush is the one who makes the declaration to John in Revelation chapter 1. I am the one which is and was and which is to come. The Almighty. It is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ speaking to Moses at the burning bush. Oh, we know that for sure. Because the second abbreviated form of God's name used in our text is, I am. This also points to our Lord Jesus Christ as the one who is the covenant God of Israel, who spoke to Abraham and gave Abraham the Abrahamic covenant. You recall what Jesus said to the Pharisees in John chapter 8, and then what he said in the Garden of Gethsemane just before his arrest. I'm beginning reading in verse 48 of John 8. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, <laughs> Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye do dishonor me. And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth, Verily, verily, I say unto you, If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast the devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you, but I know him, and Keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Now here it is, listen carefully. Here is the name by which God called himself at the burning bush, the name by which God revealed himself to Abraham in Genesis 12 and in all the reaffirmations of the covenant. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Do you understand that? The Jews understood it. Then took they up stones to cast at him, 
But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Jesus ties together two portions of scripture here. He ties together the Abrahamic covenant and claims to be the God who gave the Abrahamic covenant to Abraham. And he ties together Exodus chapter 3 where God speaks to Moses out of the burning bush and God declares, I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto thee. Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. He's claiming to be the self-sufficient, self-existing, self-determinating, self-personal, absolute, sovereign God who has existed from eternity past, who brought all into being through creation, who called Abraham and gave him a covenant, who rescued the people of Israel out of Egypt and brought them into their land of promise, the God who went before them in the wilderness and led the way and provided them with the manna every day. Jesus has just claimed to be Jehovah of the Old Testament. And that's the name that we see there in Exodus 3 as Moses talks to God out of the burning bush. The one who was before not only Moses, but before Abraham, the I Am. We find one other passage where that name occurs and where Jesus uses it of himself. In John chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kedron, where was a garden, into which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth. He didn't try to hide. He didn't run away. He didn't say, you disciples stand in front here while I make my exit and you, you hold them off. We'll meet later. Jesus, knowing that all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, interesting question, whom seek ye? Whom seek ye? It's a question that's asked multiple times in the Old Testament. It's a question that speaks of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the prophetic passages, you will seek me with all your hearts, you shall surely find me. And he asks them that question. It's a question that determines not only the person being sought, but the intent for which the person is being sought. Who are you seeking? Implying, for what reason are you seeking him? Listen to the answer. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, and I'm going to leave out the italicized word because that was added by the translators. What Jesus said unto them was, Ego emi! I am! And notice what happened when he said that. Notice the very next phrase. I am! They went backward and fell to the ground. The mere pronunciation of his name on this occasion reminded them 
of who was really in control. Just by speaking his eternal, infallible name, it knocked them over with a blaze of glory. Whom do you seek? We're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. Dear folks, if you come to Christ, if God draws you, and you are seeking him, and you hear the lovely name of Jesus, you will fall at his feet with joy and gladness. Accept him as your savior and worship him. If you come seeking him for any other purpose, remember his name is the sovereign name before which indeed every knee shall bow in things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You will either come and bow before him as your savior or you will cringe before him as your judge. You have no other alternatives. And it will happen whether you like it or not. That day is coming. I am. And they went backward and fell to the ground. That's the name that God spoke to Moses at the burning bush. Now that briefly summarizes the first three names given in our text. I am that I am. I am and Lord, Yahweh, all capitals. There are several other names, but our time is up for today. So the Lord willing, we will pick it up there next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for our Lord, Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the majestic and ineffable name of Jesus at which every knee shall bow. How we thank you, Father, for his name, which means Jehovah is salvation. He is the one who has become our salvation. How we thank you for him. Gracious Father, indeed, you have revealed yourself through your name. Not merely the mighty acts which you have done, and those are many from creation to the present, but who you are, the Holy God, the self-existent God, the God who does not depend on us, his creatures, the God who controls all things, the God who has the eternal decrees, the God who in the eternal councils in eternity past, when there was no creation, determined all that would be. You are majestic. You are awe-inspiring. All of our praise, all of our thanksgiving belongs to you. For you are Yah, a man of war. And you are our God. And we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ your blessed Son. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number...